We are currently in a sermon series in the book of Hebrews, all right? So all for our guests and, and folks who haven't been here in a while, we've been in Hebrews the entire year. It's going to take us uh, pretty much the whole year just to get through it. And literally, we've just been walking verse by verse, chapter by chapter, seeking to understand what it is this book is saying to us, because uh, it has a lot to say about Jesus, and that has massive implications for our lives. And so uh, today, uh, we're going to be in Hebrews chapter 9, right? Hebrews uh, chapter to nine. We're only going to go until verse uh, 14. Um, and so here's how it's going to work. I'm uh, going to pray, uh, and then I'm going to read uh, our passage for today, and then we're going to jump into God's Word. Is that all right? Let me pray. Father God, thank you so much for your Word. Uh, these may be uh, ancient words, they may be old words, but they're not dead. They are very much alive. And so God, uh, would you speak to us through your Word? Uh, help us to understand what it is that you want us to know about you, and, and what the next steps would be for us. What is that step of obedience that you are calling us to in light of this word? We love you. We praise you. In Jesus' beautiful name we pray. Amen. Amen. Hebrews chapter 9. Hear these words of our Father. It says, Now the first covenant also had regulations for ministry and an earthly sanctuary. For a tabernacle was set up, and in the first room, which is called the holy place, uh, were the lampstand, the table, and the presentation loaves. Behind the second uh, curtain was a tent called the most holy place. It had the gold altar of incense and the ark of the covenant, covered with gold on all sides, in which was a gold jar uh, containing the manna, Aaron's staff that budded, and the tablets of the covenant. The cherubim of glory were above the ark, overshadowing the mercy seat. It is not possible uh, to speak about these things in detail right now. What the writer of Hebrews is saying is, I've got so much more to say, but I just, I, I'm running out of time, uh, which uh, may give us a clue to maybe his ethnicity, but I don't have time to get into that right now. Uh, verse 6, with these things prepared like this, the, uh, the priest entered the first room repeatedly, performing uh, their ministry. But the high priest alone enters the second room, and he does that only once a year and never without blood which he offers for himself and for the sins the people had committed in ignorance. The Holy Spirit was making it clear uh, that the way into the most holy place had not yet been disclosed while the first tabernacle was still standing. Uh, this is a symbol for the present time during which gifts and sacrifices are offered that cannot perfect the worshiper's conscience. They are physical regulations and only deal with food, drink, and various washing imposed until the time of the new order. But Christ has appeared as a high priest of the good things that have come. In the greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is, not of this creation, he entered the most holy place once for all time, not by the blood of goats and calves, but by his own blood, having obtained eternal redemption." For if the blood of goats and bulls and the ashes of young cow, sprinkling those who are defiled, sanctify for the purification of the flesh, how much more will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish to God, cleanse our consciences from dead works so that we can serve the living God? Let's just go so far. Now, look, I'll be the first to admit that on a number of occasions in our study in the book of Hebrews, I have wondered to myself, what does this book have to do with my life in 2023? Uh, the stuff spoken about in this book seem uh, to be foreign, right? And, and the images presented to us so distant. I mean, the, the symbolism so strange. All this talk of high priests and blood sacrifices and ceremonial uh, practices and some guy called Melchizedek, a man with no beginning and no end. We've been through it all. All of this makes me wonder, why are we studying this book? But friends, there is a point. There is a point. These strange-sounding ancient rituals, symbols, and religious practices were designed by God, and they were designed by God to prepare us for the coming of Jesus Christ and the eternal life that is to be found in Him and Him alone. Uh, last week, Kenny preached an incredible sermon. Kenny's one of our elders here, uh, preached an incredible uh, sermon talking about the old covenant and the new covenant. Right? The old covenant was good, but the new covenant is so much better. So much better. There is a point. 
In fact, to make this point crystal clear from our text today, let's start with the end. Right, let's start with the end of our passage. The, the primary point I want you to take away from our time together this morning can be found in verses 13 and 14, which say, For if the blood of goats and bulls and the ashes of a young cow, sprinkling those who are defiled, sanctify for the purification of the flesh, how much more will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish to God, cleanse our conscience from dead works so that we can serve the living God. This begs the question, how do we cleanse our consciences from dead works? That, that's the thing that stands out to me in those verses. How, how? You're talking about consciences and dead works, but how do we cleanse our consciences from dead works? Or maybe another way to ask is, is, is what do you do when your, your conscience feels filthy? When it feels polluted, when it, when it feels grimy, when it feels corrupt, when it feels immoral, when it feels unclean, what do we do? Let me take a step back, all right? Let me take a step back and not assume anything. Do you guys know what a conscience is? I did a bit of reading. I read quite a bit, and here's how I've kind of summarized it. From, from the different readings, here's how I've, I've summarized what a conscience is. It's that spiritual space of the image of God forever imprinted on our souls by which we feel guilt and conviction when we do wrong and joy and comfort when we do right. It is that part or, or, or function of our souls by which our moral deeds, be they good or evil, are subjectively recognized within. Uh, here's a little interesting fact. That while the... The New Testament has a Greek word for conscience. The Old Testament does not. See, the, the, the lack of a Hebrew word for conscience, I believe, is because to the Jewish worldview, everything was communal rather than individual. The, the Hebrew considered himself or herself as a member of a covenant community that related corporately to God and his laws rather than as an individual. In other words, the Hebrew was confident in their own position before God if the Hebrew nation as a whole was in good fellowship with God. This is why we say here we have been beautifully designed for fellowship. That we don't live in isolation, that, that this matters, the, the gathering of God's people matters. Let's go back and talk about this conscience. See, everyone has one. Everyone has a conscience because we have been made in the image of God, we have a conscience. Even those who do not believe in Jesus as Lord and Savior, you have a conscience. So you can't check out. You, maybe you've been invited by a friend and you're like, hey, I came here to pray and I came to do some cool things. I really want to support some friends here and family, but, but I'm not really a Christian. I'm trying to figure this stuff out. Here, let me go ahead and settle this for you right now. You have a conscience. You have a conscience because you have been made in the image of God. And I know everyone here today knows exactly what I'm talking about when I refer to those oc occasions where your conscience feels dirty. Now, I know we're big on performing and pretending, and so we don't tell people that, but we definitely feel it. Those moments where you're just going, man, I, just, I, I don't feel so good. I don't feel so good. I'm, I'm talking about when you, you feel and sense deep within as you lie on your bed at night and reflect on the events of the day, the harsh words you spoke, the unsavory thought you had, the pride that you felt in your heart. You, you just, you're just like, this isn't, this isn't right. This isn't right. I don't feel good. My conscience doesn't feel good. I'm talking about uh, when you feel and sense deep within, when you wake up in the morning and, and, and have lustful thoughts and, and sinful fantasies running through your mind. We went quick on that one, eh? Real, real quiet. I'm talking about when you feel and sense deep within, when you navigate your way through the day without giving God so much as an afterthought. I'm talking about what you feel and sense deep within when you, you pass over in silence that incredible opportunity to share and explain the gospel with someone. 
You get back in your car and you're like, oh, I wish I had said something. Ah, there was a moment. But maybe you were gripped by fear and you didn't do anything. I'm talking about what you feel and sense deep within when you reflect on your life as a whole and all you see is one failure after another. One shattered dream after another. One devastating relationship after another. One sin after another. What do you do with that? Here's the thing. Here's the thing. As, as different as our world is today from the world of the Old Testament, uh, when, when the tabernacle was still around, the fundamental problem of the human heart is still the same. The most basic need of the human heart remains unchanged. In spite of, of all the advances that we have made throughout history, the most basic and fundamental and pressing need of our hearts is no different from what it was for those Israelites who lived during the Old Testament days when the tabernacle and then later the temple was still standing and in full operation. Our hearts are still crying out for the same thing. And so what is, what is that problem, Oni, that you're referring to, that you're pressing into? What, what, what is that problem? Could you make it plain? Sure. Uh, look, a, a filthy, unclean conscience, that's the problem, that we have this. We have this filthy, unclean conscience, a, a defiled spirit, a polluted soul, a heart that feels wicked and rebellious and for all its acts can't seem to make its way back to God. That's the problem. And we try, we try, we try, we, we, we do all these works and we do this and we do that, hoping, hoping that that'll be enough to cleanse us so that we might make our way back to God. I believe here is the question that every human heart at some point asks. It may not use these exact words. In fact, it may not even fully be aware that it's asking it. But we all want to know. We all want to know. I don't care if you're black or white or young or old or rich or poor. We all want to know. How can I come to God and be received by him and be reconciled to him when I feel so dirty? How? How can I be at peace with God when my conscience continually reminds me of my sin my lust, my greed, my pride, my selfishness, my idolatry. How? How, how? how can I be right with God? Well, what we are reading in Hebrews chapter 9 is the answer. In fact, it's the only answer, the only solution to that problem. The only thing that will purify your conscience so that you can enjoy God and know that he enjoys you. See, that's, that's the other important bit. That I think sometimes we often, we miss it. We, we go, you know, I, I enjoy God, but does God enjoy me? I love God, but does God love me? I want you to know that, that, that both of those can exist at the same time in your life. But you've got to be clear about the solution. The answer is the blood of Christ. We, we just sung it. The, the, the blood of Christ. The only way to experience the abundant life is through and in the blood of Christ. And that is precisely what the, the tabernacle and, and all its furniture and each action performed by the high priest within it are, are designed to teach us. All the stuff that we've just read. And if you've been with us for the last few months, everything that we've been walking through in the book of Hebrews, all of it is, is, is designed to make that point that it's the blood of Christ that reconciles us back to the Father. So let's take a moment and look closely at what the author is describing. Permit me to take you on a guided tour of the tabernacle, but, but through these verses, through these verses. And so here's our tour. You guys ready? You sure? It, it, it's okay. You can, you can speak back to me. You guys ready? Yeah. Great, great, great. I don't want to take someone on a tour and they're like, oh, I don't want to go there. Okay, cool. <laughs> so first, 
we see through the text that the tabernacle was divided into two sections. The holy place and then behind the curtain, the most holy place. We see this in verses 1 and 2. It says, now the first covenant also had regulations for ministry and an earthly sanctuary. For a tabernacle was set up and in the first room, which is called the holy place. You see, in the, in the holy place, we find the lampstand, the table, and the presentation loaves. Now, now the lampstand was made out of pure gold, made to look like a tree with branches and buds and blossoms, and, and this is according to Exodus uh, chapter 25, verses 31 to 37. See, this, this was a constant reminder of the tree of life, and that humanity was intended to have it in the garden at creation. It is also reminding us that we were, we were exiled because of sin, telling us the story of the fall. See, we need to be reminded, reminded of, of what it is that we have done. See, I think when we forget that, then, then this becomes too common. And when the Bible becomes too common, when the gospel becomes too common, we are entering into areas of danger. See, but God, God is bringing us back. Even though they had this reminder of the fall, there was that promise that God would bring us back, back into his presence. And we see that right in the tabernacle. There we see the story of our redemption, God's rescue mission for humanity. The lampstand was also meant to be, and this is gonna sound pretty obvious, but it was meant to be lit. <laughs> to provide light pointing to Jesus, where he says, I am the light of the world. And so right there already, they're going, hey, there's someone who's coming. This is just, this is just the trailer attraction. This is, this is just the appetizer, but the main meal is coming. Jesus is coming as a constant reminder of that. Let's keep going. We also see the presentation loaves. Some translations call it the bread of presence, which is there to remind God's people of his presence and his provision for them in the garden. That in the garden, I, I was present with you. I walked, walked with man, and I will provide for you. But this also points to Jesus, where he says, I am the bread of life. Friends, when, when we read the Old Testament, my hope is that we would have our Jesus lenses on. As we look through passages, we might ask the question, okay, what does this mean for them, but what is it pointing to? Yeah. This is why the new covenant just keeps getting better and better and better. Verse 3, behind the second curtain was a tent called the most holy place. See, then in, in, in verse 3, we see the curtain that transitions us from the holy place into the most holy place, what we call the holy of holies. This, this curtain separated the, the holy of holies from the holy place. This curtain, known as the veil, was made of fine linen with blue and purple and scarlet wool. And there were figures on this curtain, figures of cherubim embroidered onto it. A cherubim was a, an angelic being who, who, who served God. That's what they did. They were in the presence of God to demonstrate how powerful God is. But what was this curtain hiding? Why have a curtain? Well, essentially, it was shielding a holy God from sinful humanity. Whoever entered into the Holy of Holies was entering the very presence of God. In fact, anyone except the high priest who entered the Holy of Holies would die. So if you're trying to sneak in there, and to, I don't know what you were going to do, you would drop dead. Even the high priest, God's chosen mediator with his people, could only pass through the veil and enter this sacred dwelling only once a year. On a fixed day called the day of atonement. See, the, the, the curtain, the, the, the veil was a, was a reminder of our inability to regain paradise. That's why it was there. Another reminder of the fall of humanity because we gave in to sin. Now, I know some of you might be like, oh, I wasn't there in the beginning. I get that. I get that's one of the questions that I ask all the time. What, because of Adam and Eve, why am I here? 
But you see, because of Adam and Eve, sin now bleeds through humanity. It bleeds through humanity. But then, through the veil, we enter the most holy place. Let's continue on our tour. Verses 3 and 5. You see, behind the curtain was a tent called the most holy place. It had the gold altar of incense and the Ark of the Covenant covering uh, with gold on all sides in which was a gold jar containing the manna, Aaron's staff that budded and the tablets of the covenant. This is the Ten Commandments. Did you guys notice all the gold? There's a lot of gold here. It's everywhere. We, we see gold all over the place, which, which is a reminder again of the land of Eden. All of it is pointing back to the beginning when things were good. Now you might go, the land of Eden and gold. Oh, no, where did you get that from? I'm glad you asked. I don't know if many of you know this, but, but the Garden of Eden, among other amazing things, had gold everywhere. You can go read about it in uh, Genesis uh, chapter 2, verse 18 to, to 14. Verse 8 to 14. You'll see it. There's gold everywhere. Then we see incense mentioned in verse 4, which burned every morning and every evening, reminding us from Exodus 30 of how God's presence was with his people as a pillar of cloud by day and a pillar of fire by night. And the essence that we read about in verse 4, this is interesting, uh, was made with some fragrant spices, and one of them was frankincense. A little side note, if you go read Exodus 30, you'll find uh, instructions to Moses to include myrrh in the anointing oil that would be used to anoint. The incense was placed on a gold altar, and the altar was anointed with oil. And all of that has gold, frankincense, and myrrh. It is, it is all pointing to Jesus. The detail, the, the detail is all, like, and sometimes we just read right past it. I have no idea what they took, gold, incense, okay, cool, essential oils. Okay, they had essential oils in the tabernacle. What's, the, what's that got to do with anything? Friends, it's, all of it points to Jesus. That, that's why this is just getting better and better and better. If we were to open the Ark of the Covenant, we would find three things in there. A golden jar holding manna, Aaron's staff that budded, and the tablets of the covenant. You see, see the, the, the manna reminding them of God's redemptive provision in the wilderness. Go read about it in Exodus 16. The, the staff bringing to mind his, his mediating work through the priesthood. Go read about it in Numbers chapter 17. And then the Ten Commandments showing us God's unchanging character, which serves as the foundation of all goodness, of all morality, and all truth, again, all of it reminding us, reminding us. Verse 5 then says, The cherubim of glory were above the ark, overshadowing the mercy seat. And then he says, It is not possible to speak about these things in detail right now. That, that, that all of it, all of it was glorious. That's the point of that verse there. All of it was glorious. The cherubim of the glory continuously looked down in wonder. If you go look at these pictures, go Google it. Looks down and want as they knelt at the mercy seat with their wings arched and touching overhead. Glory, glory here is the synonym for God. So even as amazing as the cherubim was, they're going, no, 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 God. We read about it in Revelations 4, like it's epic. Go read Revelation. It's, it's incredible what we read in Revelation. And all of it, all of it is going, no, holy, holy Holy. Don't look at me. Look at who I'm pointing to. Don't be impressed with me. Be impressed with the one I am pointing to. Everything about this is glorious. Everything about it is glorious. See, only the, the high priest of Israel could enter the Holy of Holies, and he could do this only once a year on the Day of Atonement. Uh, we, we read of this in, in Hebrews uh, chapter 9. Verse 6 and 10, I read it in the introduction. 
And when you have time, I'd encourage you to go read Leviticus 16. And I know it doesn't make like a early in the morning, you know, a cup of coffee, Leviticus. <laughs> I get it. But in light of what I've just said, if you, if you read Hebrews uh, chapter 9, verse 6 to 10, and then you go and read Leviticus 16, I'm telling you, the lights will come on. You'll go, oh, oh okay, that's what, oh, I see what's happening here. I see what's going on here. Some, sometimes I'm very thankful that we stand on this side of the cross and we look and we can see, we see everything. That's why I think sometimes we'll just be like, ah, oh, no, I know Judas is going to betray. You know, it's not as oh, epic. I know, I know this is going to happen. But, but I, I sometimes wonder, what would it have been like to, to hear the, the, this book being read? Like people gathered like this and then they read it and they're going, oh my goodness. Oh my goodness. Oh my goodness. Like the whole time you're just being blown away. I hope that our hearts would do that as we read God's word. Remembering that all of it has a point. What I want us to see is the writer of Hebrews' statement in verse 9. This is a symbol of the present time during which gifts and sacrifices are offered that cannot perfect the worshiper's conscience. So all, all of this that's happening is great, but it's just... It's just a symbol. Because it doesn't, it doesn't get us over the line. And that's where we want to be. We want to be over the line. But it, it, it just doesn't get us over the line. All that these offerings and sacrifices could do, they, it was just to cleanse the person outwardly so that they could join in with the rest of God's people in worship and prayer. That we would gather together in expectation of what God will do. But it wasn't enough to cleanse us inwardly. These offerings and sacrifices only cleansed their bodies, removing ceremonial defilement and qualifying them for life in the community with God's people. But their consciences were never fully and finally and forever cleansed of the polluting power of guilt that was brought by sin. It just wasn't enough. He also says in verse 9, that this way of relating to God through animal sacrifices in an earthly tabernacle was symbolic. Symbolic of the present time. He means the old covenant days. His point is that he himself is living in a time of transition from the old covenant to the new. From the old to the new. With the coming of Christ, the old way of relating to God has been replaced we have entered into what he calls in verse 10, the time of the new order. We are in the time of the new order. The, the person and the finished work of Jesus Christ have replaced the entire ritual sacrificial system of the old covenant. This is a big deal. If you go read Leviticus 16, you actually realize this is a big deal because there was a lot that the people of God had to do just, just to be with God just to open up their mouths to him. There was, there was so much that had to be done. And yet we're told Jesus comes. The finished work of Jesus yes. replaces all of that. Amen. So, so what did the tabernacle and its furniture and the activities that took place within the courtyard actually mean then? What's the main point on it? Like you've said a lot, but what, what, what is the main point? What, what did it symbolize? What are we supposed to learn from it all? Let me share three real quick things, all right? So if you're that person, you got your notes, and you're like, I'm waiting on it. I'm waiting for you to, to say point number one. Here it is. What do we learn from all of this? What is the point of all of this? Well, firstly, we should see that the wonderful construction of the tabernacle, detail after detail after detail with the aesthetic extravaganza of all its finishes, and the, and the sophisticated designs and all the embroidered things and the curtain and the gold and the variety of colors throughout, that all of this is deliberate. Yes. And I know sometimes we go, you know, we, we get it personally. That's why many of us will decorate our homes and we'll be intentional about what we put up and the color scheme and how these things, it's inten and, you, and you think, like, where do you think you got that from? God is the same. Yes. And all of this is to serve as a visual sermon, declaring the beauty of God. God is saying, I am beautiful. Yes. 
I am beautiful. Everything in the tabernacle and then later in the temple pointed to the beauty of God, to his holiness, to how magnificent he is, to his majesty, to his glory. That you should stand and go, oh my goodness. I think we need to go back to a time where our church buildings are beautiful. There used to be a time like that. You'll drive from town to town and city to city and you'll see it, just, just how beautiful this building is. Because what we're communicating is that God is beautiful yes. and he is worthy of it all. And so, and so point number one, what is all this about? Well, it points to the fact that God is beautiful. He is holy. He's glorious. Secondly, the tabernacle and everything in it was a daily reminder, not just of God's holiness, but also of humanity's sinfulness. Everything declared, stay away. Do not draw near. They'd have a sign outside that would say, Bus up. <laughs> <laughs> Little interesting story. Um, some of you would know, I'm, I'm originally from Botswana, so I grew up in Botswana. And I uh, grew up in a small mining town. Well, the, the, the mine basically owned everything and ran everything. There was pros and cons to that. But grew up there, and, uh, and so we had a lot of people from outside of Botswana who would come and work on the mine. We call them expats, all right? And, and the expats had, had, had a particular area where they lived. The houses were nice. Um, everything was really, really cool. Uh, I don't have time to get into that, but, but it was really cool. And, and I had friends there, went to school with everyone, and uh, would ride my bike uh, through the suburbs. And I remember seeing the, the sign uh, with, a, with, a, with a very vicious dog on it that said Pasop. And I was like, man, that's a really interesting name for a really scary dog. Like, it, it just doesn't, doesn't tie together. Like, it doesn't make sense. And then I keep riding my bike, and I'd be like, maybe it's a common name, because it's like, there's, there's four dogs on the street called Pasop. Like, what is going on here? Um, and then I later came to South Africa uh, and studied Afrikaans, and I was sitting there as a 14-year-old, and I went, oh, <laughs> makes, makes sense, makes, makes, makes sense. It's like, yeah, we also have our things. Huh? Everyone knows a sporty. Yes. Right? Anyone know a dog called sporty? Yes. Yeah. yeah. And it's not like one dog that just like moves around. And, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm digressing. I'm digressing. Let's come back to the text. It was, it was a reminder. It was a reminder that you cannot enter here. You cannot enter here because of your sin. There's no access for you to God because of your sin. And it's so weird. It's so weird. Like, I think sometimes, we may not say this verbally, but sometimes we'll say it in our hearts. We'll go, that's not fair. I'm telling you, if we understand who God is, when people say that, you should go, I just want to get away from that person. Because, friends, you don't want fair with God. You don't. You don't. We, we receive mercy and grace. Mercy is, is, is not receiving what you deserve. And what do we deserve? Death. Grace is, is receiving what you don't deserve. What do we get? We're adopted into the family. We have an inheritance. There is blessing after blessing after blessing after blessing. And there's, like, we don't deserve, like, what did I do? I stood there looking and going, you, I can't get in. God, what if I try to do this? What if I try to do this? Not enough. What if I'm a good boy? Not enough. Yep. Yep. Please be a good boy. <laughs> what, what if I show up every Sunday gathering? Not enough. It's, it's great to gather because then we're reminded of this. Yes. And then we sing together as the people of God. But I'm telling you, if, you, if you're hoping that that's what's going to get you access to the Father, it's not enough. But I'm a leader in the, not enough. It's only when we recognize that we are in desperate need of a savior. It's when we recognize that I, I, I am sinful, that, that I, I, I need the savior, I need the blood of Christ. And so it was a reminder of that. And then thirdly, the tabernacle and everything in it pointed to the coming of the person and the work of Jesus Christ. Is that one day he's coming. 
one day he's coming. God is going to send his son. But we live on this side of the cross, and so God has sent his son. Let, let me remind you that when John the, the Apostle described the incarnation of the Son of God, the entrance into human flesh, in, into the, the, this, this life, this world, here's what he says in John chapter 1, verse 14. He says, the word became flesh and dwelt among us. This, this word dwelt can, can be better translated from the Greek as he tabernacled with us. Just another reminder. Because they were wondering, I'm sure year after year, has he come yet? Has he come yet? Has he come yet? Has he come yet? And then one day Jesus comes and then John says, he's come to tabernacle with us. That's him. That's him. Oh, friends, I know this is a lot. This is a lot. But let's not get lost in the forest, all right? I'm going to call the band up. Let me, let me wrap this up. Um, all, all of this is beautiful. This is a beautiful forest. And, and, and like the writer of Hebrews, he, he's going, man, there's so much more that I, I want to say. And even me, even preparing this, I was like, man, there's, there's so much. I want. Can I say, okay, I've got to cut that out. I've got to cut that out. Someone's got to, uh, they, they've got lunch plans and, and there's, a, there's, a, there, there's something in the oven and it might be burning. Oh, it's burning. Some of y'all are looking at me like, it's burning. <laughs> Wrap it up, you know? So, so I'm going, okay, how do I, there's a lot here and I don't want people to get lost in what's going on here. And so let me end with where we began, which was the end. Verses 13 and 14. It says, For if the blood of goats and bulls and the ashes of a young cow sprinkled those who are defiled, sanctifying for the purification of the flesh, how much more will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish to God, cleanse our conscience? See, the blood of the bulls and the goats that could only provide external ceremonial cleansing. The blood of the Lord Jesus Christ cleanses our consciences and brings us the final and full forgiveness of sins. That's the point of the text. And what is our conscience being purified of? What is it being cleansed from? Well, the writer of Hebrews tells us from dead works. And there's a, little, there's a lot of dead works in here, yeah. mine included. He, the, the writer of Hebrews, has in mind everything we have ever done thinking that it would save our souls. Everything we have ever said hoping that our words would turn away God's wrath. Everything we have ever gave or sacrificed or promised or turned away from thinking that it would put our conscience and our heart and our mind at rest. He's saying all of that is dead works. They are, as the writer of Hebrews puts it, they're dead works. Dead because they have no power to reconcile us to God. They are dead because they come from hearts that are dead. Absent of spiritual life. The dead cannot produce life. The dead cannot free us from sin. The dead cannot liberate us from the chains of despair. Only the living, and his name is Jesus. He is the one that makes us alive. He is the one who through his death and resurrection brings us life. Only then, only then, with a pure conscience, one made right with God, clean by the blood of Christ, can we then serve the living God. Only then. Only then can we love him and glorify him the way that we were originally designed to. And so here's my prayer for you this morning. Is that this would be true of you. And, and it's so easy to miss it, especially in our context, especially in South Africa. It's so easy to miss it because, because we still call ourselves a Christian nation. We're familiar with the things of God. And so I grew up in church. I show up to a community group. I have a Bible in my home. But friends, if you have not surrendered your life to Jesus as Lord and Savior, you are not free. You are just performing 
dead work after dead work after dead work after dead work, hoping that that will gain you access to the Father, and it won't. It's not perfect lives that God is looking for in us because He knows we cannot do it. He's looking for the perfect one who lives in you. And that only happens if you are covered by the blood. I want freedom for you guys. I really do. I want freedom. That's, that's my prayer, that we would experience freedom. Bro, bro, brother, brother Yun says this. He says, I feel sorry that many Christians live in bondage even though Jesus has signed their release form with his own blood. And so are you still paralyzed by a filthy conscience? A dirty conscience? Does that feeling of moral stain on your soul leave you in despair and hopelessness? There is only one solution. Only one thing that can cleanse and make you whole. And that is the blood of Jesus Christ that was shed at the cross for you and me. And for all of those who believe that counted for them, you will be saved. And so we're going to respond. We're going to respond because I believe the gospel demands a response. And so many of us like, will hear these words and just kind of carry on with our lives. No, 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 no. We must respond. We respond by singing. We respond by praying. And we respond by obedience. And so we're going to sing. And in a few moments, we're going to sing. And I, I say this often. I want you guys to sing your faces off because you recognize, you realize. You're like, oh my goodness, that is what Jesus has done for me. Do not let the dignity of man get in the way of your worship to God. What will people think? Can I do this? Can I? It's the audience of one. And so maybe that's you. You just need to sing. You sing your heart out. Maybe you showed up in here recognizing and realizing what Jesus has done for you, and you're like, I just can't wait. On it, would you stop talking because I want to sing? And so we're going to do that. But we respond also by praying. Some of you need to pray. We dedicate this corner here, these steps. We call them the prayer corner so you can come and kneel here. But you know what? You can come to the front and you can come whenever you want because you're crying out to God. Now you might go, oh, oh, no, I don't need to come to the front. I totally get that. You don't. But you know, sometimes the, the, the body is communicating what's happening in here. And so we race to the front to go, you know what? I just, I just want to fall flat and just, just cry out to him. Jesus, I need you. Maybe that's a prayer for someone here this morning. It's simple. I just need you. What for? I'm not 100% sure. Jesus, I just need you. There is an emptiness in me. There is, there is anxiety in me. There is worry in me. I just need you. Please do not leave until you've cried out to him. And then we obey. Some of you may not like that word, obedience. So I'll use a different one. What is your next step? What is your next step? Maybe for you it's to join a family group. Maybe for you it's to get plugged into a community. Maybe you're, you're a guest and you, you came to visit, but you know you're not plugged into a, a community of faith. Well, this one could be the one for you. What is your next step in response to what Jesus has done for you? Maybe it's to serve. You've been thinking about it. It's been there. It's been like, oh, I want to serve. I want to. But there's that, 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 that filthy conscience in there that goes, but if they really knew who I was, you know what Jesus does and still he died for you. So what is your next step? And then maybe for some of you, that next step is just simply to Jesus. It's to surrender your life to Jesus. Deep down, you know you're not a Christian. You're hoping that your granny's faith will get you in. Or your pastor's faith will get you in. Or the fact that you know good theology, that that will get you in. I'm not against doctrine, I love it. But the only thing that will get you in is surrendering your life to Jesus, having the blood of Jesus cover you. And so let's respond. Let's respond like free people. So I'm going to ask everyone in here to stand, and I'm going to pray, and then we're going to sing. Our good and gracious Father, you are good, and you are full of grace. We thank you for your word. We thank you that we can come to it and, and continually dig and dig and dig and we get to learn more and more and more of who you are and what you've done for us. 
Father, I pray for the folks in here who do not know you as Lord and Savior. God, I pray that you would remove every single obstacle that's in their way and that they might cry to you and say, Jesus, I need you as my Lord and Savior. Save me now. And if that is anyone in here this morning, because I believe God's words are true, then you are saved. And now you have access into the Holy of Holies. God, I pray for those who have been walking with you for a while, but maybe have drifted, maybe things have become stale. And we look at this world and how broken it is, and we just, we wonder, we wonder, is there any hope? And so we want to give up. God, I pray by the power of your spirit, you would hold on to us. And then remind us that one day, Jesus, you will return to make all things new. But until that day, you walk with us step by step in our marriages, in our work, in our relationships, in our thoughts, in our ambitions, in our desires, in our hearts. You will never leave us nor forsake us. And so we thank you for the blood. Father, help us to respond. In Jesus' beautiful name we pray. 